From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, meet me in Singapore. At a swanky Singapore hotel named the Shangri-La, the leaders of China and Taiwan will meet this weekend for the first time in 66 years. When the two nations split, it was late 1949. Mao Zedong's communists had defeated a nationalist army, forcing that army to take refuge in Taiwan. Well, time heals all wounds. Today, China's President Xi Jinping and Taiwan's President Ma Yingzhou have become friends. But even if their meeting goes well at the Shangri-La, and analysts expect it will, things could later derail. Here's why. Taiwan's President Ma is popular with China, but Taiwan will hold a presidential election in January, and polls suggest the less friendly to China opposition candidate Tsai Ing-wen will win. In turn, analysts fear relations between China and Taiwan may deteriorate, perhaps even leading to conflict. China has long warned it might use force if politically Taiwan moves too far away from mainland China. And that's where the United States comes in, because we are committed to the defense, not of mainland China, but of Taiwan. The question is a new crisis brewing in the Taiwan Strait, Pat. First, we're not committed to go to war on behalf of Taiwan. The treaty was abrogated in 1979 by Jimmy Carter when we recognized China uh, as the country that represents both Taiwan and China. But I will say this, John, the, the party that is, is meeting with Mao, with meeting with uh, Xi Jinping down there in Singapore, is the, the old Kuomintang which, of Chiang Kai-shek, which represents the Chinese who fled to the island in 1949, and it's strongly Chinese. The indigenous Taiwanese basically are more supportive of this party, which wants, it's fearful of too close a connection to mainland China, although economically and diplomatically and other ways, they're getting closer and closer. But what you're not gonna get, John, is a declaration of independence by Taiwan and declaring itself a nation state because that would mean war in the Taiwan Straits. That is the red line for mainland China. Is Xi likely to use the time between now and the January presidential election to try to intimidate Taiwan, Eleanor? I think the meeting in Singapore this weekend is highly symbolic and it is China's attempt to bolster the party that's currently in control in Taiwan. That party is likely to lose in January and the opposition party is running on a campaign to declare Taiwanese independence. But they've been in power before, and they dance around this because I think everyone recognizes they don't really want China to make good on its threats to invade if Taiwan does declare independence. And the U.S. has a clear stake here in Taiwan not being too provocative. So this is a delicate dance on the part of all the parties involved, and it's a way too early to be uh, declaring that these two parts of China are going to come yeah. to any kind of collision. Uh, is there a risk uh, beyond what uh, Eleanor was talking about? Well, look, I, I disagree with Pat in the sense that I think the Jimmy Carter statement, what we actually have seen since then, especially with Clinton in 96, with the positioning of the Seventh Fleet to really challenge China when they were pushing towards, hey, you better vote one way, otherwise we're going to take military action. I think that becomes important. I think the Chinese are going to struggle in terms of convincing the Taiwanese people to vote in a certain way. But I do think Eleanor is right in the sense that Taiwan does not want to provoke a military incident with China in which, I mean, you just look at the map and you look at the scale, I think the outcome would be pretty clear. At the same time, as a final point, I think the United States, we do need to take a stand. And this is why, you know, I praise the president for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We also need to take tougher action at Spratly Islands about credibility there with the U.S. Navy in the Pacific region. Is there a risk that Xi Jinping might an think he can annex Taiwan and get away with it, as Vladimir Putin did with uh, the Crimea? 
Uh, the histories are different, and uh, the sense that uh, that Taiwan is part of China is so strong, uh, and it's in everybody's benefit to at least maintain the status quo as far as that's concerned. That I don't think there's a real uh, threat of that happening. Uh, the main thing uh, is that China is trying very hard to to woo Taiwan like it does other countries with 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 lots of economic benefits. Uh, China is already so tied in with the U.S. economy, it would it would be to their detriment to uh, John, have I hostile was, relations. Yeah, I was in China. I was in China with. Let's just mm -hmm. advance the point here. Yeah. What I have here is the U.S. currently holds ninety eight billion dollars in Taiwan's foreign security. That's right. Uh, well, and we also, what, uh, China's got even more than that of American debt. So, uh, right. so we're, we're all interdependent economically. In that but John, sense. I was in China with Richard Nixon and under the Shanghai communique, Henry Kissinger helped to write. He said, you know, both, on both sides of the Taiwan Strait, the Chinese believe that Taiwan is a part of China. We do not argue with that. So Taiwan is not an independent nation. It is not in the United Nations. It is not recognized by anybody. It ought to be, but it's, I mean, 200, we've got 25 million people or something like that. And I do agree that if the Chinese attempted a military attack on Taiwan, the United States would move. But we have no treaty commitment now to do that because of Jimmy Carter. But we have well, inferred, and the, and we have the, given the impression. Yeah, and the, the Taiwanese government is operating on the sort of fantasy that they are the legitimate government of China. And once that communist insurgency is over, mm -hmm. they will return uh, to Beijing. And that's worked, yeah, it's worked for 50 or 60 years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, maybe they'll test the proposition in January, but I, I think Everybody's they, they will not avoided they a will collision not declare, until now. They will not declare independence. I, I agree with that. I uh, the question. If Beijing invades Taiwan, will President Obama go to Taiwan's defense as required by the U.S. agreement, which Pat says has been canceled, or will he blink? You've already answered the question. Well, wait a minute. Now. Uh, Xi Jinping would be an utter disaster for mainland China yeah. if they fired missiles at Taiwan or sought to invade Taiwan. All of Asia would be opposed to them diplomatically, I, and I think the United States would move militarily probably in the Put Taiwan. Put the submarines well, in the, the Taiwan. That's, 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 the, that's the nightmare scenario, but I don't believe we're going to get to that. Do right. uh, you want to add anything to this? Well, uh, uh, only that we're a long way from the crisis phase. I mean, it, it, it's very similar to the, to the Monroe Doctrine in a way that uh, we recognize that this is within China's sphere of influence. It's just that uh, we get concerned if they go too far in yeah. terms of uh, that, that, that appear to be threatening mm -hmm. military Who's action. Monroe? Oh, Jim. William. Uh, uh, James Monroe. James, James Monroe, Monroe, not William. James Monroe. <laughs> President of the United States. He, where who, is he in the sequence of presidents after George Washington? Oh, you had he to ask fourth. that, didn't you? That's why I'm not a history major. He well, knows. Fourth. There you go. Pat, Pat always knows that. Who, <laughs> yes, he was who fifth. Who were three, two, and one besides Washington? Three and two. Was Adams. He, he was, look, Jefferson. Adams. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, oh, Monroe, Adams, Jackson. Issue two. Peace from Vienna. And what makes it real this time, unlike any other previous meeting, every stakeholder was represented there in terms of all of the countries <coughs> who are supporting one side or another in this conflict. Peace talks to resolve the four and a half year Syrian civil war are underway in Vienna, Austria. The urgency is clear. Most estimates suggest that at least 100,000 civilians have been killed in that war thus far. Mr. Assad met with Mr. Putin in Moscow not long ago to discuss the Syrian civil war and Russia's military assistance to Assad's regime. And get this. On Wednesday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met with UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura to discuss how to initiate talks between Mr. Assad's government and the rebels fighting his regime. But even if hope is on the horizon, big problems remain. Namely, boiling tensions between two other nations at the summit, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Thus far, the Saudi and Iranian foreign ministers have used the Vienna talks to blame each other for Syria's problems. Question, what change has President Obama made in his demands regarding Syria to give momentum to these talks? Eleanor. Well, some 
months ago, he indicated that uh, the U.S. would accept a temporary stay for Assad. They weren't demanding that he get out immediately. And then about 10 days ago, the president basically upped the ante with the military intervention, saying that the U.S. would be sending in special ops and a, a couple of thousand uh, uh, soldiers, I believe. Uh, I think the, the idea of getting more muscle behind the military intervention in Syria on both the U.S. part and the Russian part is so that they have kind of equal leverage at the, uh, at the mm -hmm. talks. And this is the first time, as the Se Secretary Kerry pointed out, you've got Saudi Arabia and Iran sitting down. You've got an opposition leader from uh, Syria, mm -hmm. not a particularly credible one, but you've got one. So you've got everybody represented. They all have different interests, but there is one common thread. They all want to defeat ISIS. And so I think the possibility exists that they could come out with some sort of a right. plan. Right now, there are no good options. It's all bad news. So, you know, I think the situation needs shaking up. The, the human tragedy spilling out of Syria is, is horrific. Well, that's well stated, but take note of this. President Obama's new position is that Assad can stay for now and possibly longer. The U.S. position is that we will accept Assad's regime if that is the only way to end the war. We don't have Num any choice. No. Uh, we, we don't, don't have any choice. All right, we don't. Number two, Russia's military intervention in Syria. It is now clear that Russia is determined to salvage the Assad regime and wipe out the Syrian opposition if necessary. Is well, that true or false? Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, well. You know, in deference, I will let go Pat go first, and then I will come on. Well, let me say, John, look, with the Russian, Assad's not going to go because the Russians got 4,000 troops in there. They're doing more bombing than we are. The Iranians are behind Assad. They've got skin in the game in there. We sent 50 guys right. into Syria. Are you kidding? Yeah. Here's what's yeah. going to happen. The Russians and the Iranians are not committed to Assad indefinitely. But what they are committed is to basically Alawite control of that particular part of Syria, somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. Assad now holds because they don't want to lose their ally there. The Russians don't want to lose their base there. But let me tell you, John, the Americans are relying on one force against ISIS, the Kurds, who will fight. There's 25,000 of them. The problem is, as the Kurds succeed, the Turks, right. who are our allies, get more and more alarmed. And they say if the Kurds cross yeah. the Euphrates going west, they will attack right. the and, Kurds. And here's the right. thing. I think the extension to that, the problem we have, yes, we sent 50 people in there. That is not a symbol of American power. It is a symbol of American disinterest. The Russians know that. The Iranians know that. They hold the cards. You see the Saudis now flipping. Adel, who is the Saudi foreign minister, the Iranians tried to kill him in D.C. in 2011. So he has a personal grudge there. But he also has a, a, pers a professional grudge in the sense the Saudis are deeply concerned about the Iranians and the Russians appropriating that conflict, killing all of the moderate right. rebels or semi-moderate rebels allowing ISIS to have one side. I would say the final point, though, is as much as the Kurds are useful, they have territorial interests in the north. And so relying on them wholly is a problem because Erdogan, who's just right. obviously been elected, goes and smashes them. But, so, you know, but, but it's true that we will see is concerned about the, uh, about the Kurds. Uh, but uh, we've also, uh, well, Turkey's also loosened uh, their position insofar as, as allowing us to use uh, their uh, bases, bases as well, which, which is a positive step. Uh, and uh, we, uh, all sides are united in opposition to ISIS. That's about right. the only thing that unites but, but you all know, sides the here. The Saudis yes. and the Gulf Arabs were helping initially, as were the Turks, helping ISIS, allowing right. these people well, to go in yeah, there. And, they're and the guys who are going to win this now. battle are the guys who are going in and putting the troops in and doing the fighting. In this war, I think the war is well, going to lend itself and, and, to a military uh, and, and, and Putin in, has said, maybe he's only giving it lip service, he has said he would be amenable to Assad eventually stepping down, that he could see him as an interim got, leader as well. So, okay, I mean, they're, 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 at least they're talking. It's better than not yeah. talking, okay, so quickly, I'm for diplomacy. Uh, Eleanor, if you're so bright, what is going on with the Russian airliner that was down over the Sinai on Saturday? Was it destroyed by a bomb? I think all the indications initially were that this uh, airline has a terrible safety record, that the plane itself had had some sort of hit on its tail. Uh, but then people are now saying they saw a flash in the sky. That could be a fuel tank. It could be a bomb. There's an investigation. Mm. Uh, um, I think the, the Russians uh, really uh, don't want to see yeah. that this could be terrorism. Yeah. Nobody has confirmed it. Maybe we'll learn more in an, invest in an investigation. But. Uh, the very UK and Germany uh, have, have suspended bomb, flights to that part of the world, be real, and yeah. I hope it's out of an abundance of caution. General Page. Yes, sir. <laughs> what is your view on this? I agree with my colleagues here that uh, that the conventional wisdom, including President Obama, is not. Am I a colleague? Forward. Do I count on that? <laughs> 
Not, not, that's a good technical question, John. I always view you as our supreme <laughs> beloved leader. Ah, <laughs> I leader. knew you were a bright Dear man. leader. Answer yes, the question. Uh, no, I, well, even President Obama said, said, said uh, uh, he uh, evidence points to, uh, yeah, to, a bomb. to a bomb. And uh, one thing Putin uh, is really worried about is terrorism in his own country. And uh, he's had, mm -hmm. had it before with the Chechens. Uh, it is a big concern with ISIS, yeah. and it would be a big embarrassment. Given okay, what, okay. Given what he did to the Chechens, I yeah. think yeah. if they yeah. find out it's a bomb. Okay. There'll be retaliation That's by right. the Russians. The real star of this program, issue three, Michelle and Kata. When we truly start to value their minds and respect their bodies and give them the education they need to fulfill their potential, that doesn't just transform their lives. It transforms their families and their countries, too. Speaking in Doha, the capital of Qatar, this week, First Lady Michelle Obama called for better education and better security for girls. Mrs. Obama was passionate, stating that 62 million girls around the world are not in school and that gender gaps remain significant in both social and economic spheres. The First Lady also spoke about the dangers girls face in places like Nigeria and Pakistan, where Islamic extremists have kidnapped or attacked school-age girls. But later, on a lighter note, Mrs. Obama also took comedian Conan O'Brien with her to meet with U.S. military personnel stationed in Qatar. Question, is Michelle becoming a more activist first lady? Eleanor, yet again, you. <laughs> I think she's been out front on all these issues. Maybe we're just paying more attention now. But when you go overseas and make these statements, it reminds me of when Hillary Clinton went to Beijing and said women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights once and for all. I mean, she's, she's Mrs. Obama is putting down her marker as a champion for yeah. education for girls around the world. I think it tells us something about what she's going to do after she leaves the White House. And she's not prepping a run when? for herself for the White House. This is a when, kind of a pure ideolo ideological we, commitment. When, we, when, have, when have we heard this kind of speech making before? Shall I tell you? Are you talking about besides this first lady, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, why don't you tell us, John? Laura Bush. <laughs> Laura Bush, OK. Uh, made the education and empowerment of girls and women a priority of hers in George W. Bush's first year in office, starting with a radio address in 2001 on the oppression of Afghan women. Uh -huh. Laura Bush continues to be involved with her Afghan Women's Project at the Bush Institute. She has remained active on the issue yeah. as the problem, a former first lady. Does that impress you, Patrick? Uh, look, I think what she said there basically was right. She didn't say it in Saudi Arabia. She said it in Qatar. As for Afghanistan, John, I hate to say it, but Mr. Obama and we have pulled out of there. We're down to 9,500 troops. The Taliban are on the move. And the Lord help those girls and women. Uh, if that thing goes down to the Taliban, I'll tell you, because for all our lectures and all the rest of it, the Muslim world, by and large, does not agree on the kind of equality for women that we do here in the United States. Like it or not, there are 1.5 well, billion and that, people. And that's, why, that's why I think Michelle Obama making that speech was it was much better than when she had to bring back our girls with the sad face. I mean, mm -hmm. this is Michelle Obama really doing something important, standing there, clearly passionate. She's always been passionate about that. And I give her credit for it, going to Qatar, because, you know, as much as Qatar has some reforms for female rights there, they also throw a lot of money at Salafis who hate women. Right. And the problem, I would say as well, is that what we have to see is Michelle Obama putting that one side, and liberals are, of course, celebrating that. They should also celebrate the fact that we are standing our ground. I would hope we would have more troops in Afghanistan because <laughs> women's rights is not just in the easy sense. It has to be on the ground in these places, We're Nigeria gonna against ISIL. We're going to send armies in to, uh, to protect women's rights no, all no, through no, no, the Muslim no, no. world? We have, no. we have soldiers who are training the capacity of the Afghans to take over. And actually, you've got to stay there. Actually, until actually there are a lot of girls who are going to school in Afghanistan. And I think that ch that society, too, is going to have to go through some changes. They're not going to go back to the yeah. 12th century. Kill it to the It'll Taliban. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we need to be there because of yeah. places like Helmand, you know, in the yeah. Kandahar in the south. We, you know, that's, that's where. Right. Yeah. That's Do right. you find it a little mm -hmm. odd, though, when we haven't seen that much of her mm -hmm. right until this Qatar appearance? And well, then she I don't suddenly find it pops up? 
yeah. with Carter. Yeah, I don't find it well, odd, but I find it significant because, I mean, she goes to a lot of places that the media don't cover. Uh, yeah. But she also picks and chooses where she goes very carefully. She doesn't go everywhere that, that, that the president goes uh, 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 here in the States, let alone overseas. So I think this is indicative of what Eleanor was talking about earlier. This shows how important this issue is to her uh, and, and that I think we can see her becoming even more involved right. with it uh, internationally yeah. after the Obama presidency yeah. is over and the uh, the Save Our Girls uh, episode, I think, was kind of a turning point for her, really, at that point, where, where we really yeah. saw her taking a high-profile position on women's rights uh, around the but planet. But this is real to the first hashtag. Yeah, was that was a quick hashtag. In, thing. In, 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 in Tokyo, in, uh, in mm -hmm. Japan, talking about uh, women's rights, uh, Japan right. is a country that is struggling to bring more women in because they need them in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, Education is what transformed her life, and uh, she's a very convincing uh, proselytizer on behalf of educating mm -hmm. young girls and women. Yeah, yeah let's hear it for I don't for see, I don't, and there has been some criticism. I don't get really criticism for Michelle Obama doing this because well, it's an important issue. I don't know which no, right wing sites you're yeah. tuned into, right. but that's the only place you're going to find criticism. <laughs> Abundantly. <laughs> right. Yes, let's hear it from Michelle, right? Yeah. Let's hear it from Michelle. Issue four. Keystone Confusion. The long delayed, highly controversial Keystone XL pipeline is back in the news. This week, in a formal request to the U.S. government, the pipeline's owners, the TransCanada Corporation, requested that a U.S. State Department review of the pipeline be delayed. Analysts believe TransCanada sought a delay so that Keystone XL's future was left to a future Republican president rather than the current one. But TransCanada's hopes did not come to fruition. The U.S. State Department rejected TransCanada's request, and things soon became worse for the Canadian company. On Friday, President Obama rejected a morning, permit everybody. for Keystone XL on grounds of climate change. Unless a new president reverses Mr. Obama's decision, the Keystone XL pipeline is now very dead. Does this mean no more oil from Canada? I ask you. Uh, well, I think the big, uh, no, we are still going to have oil, the American energy. But I think a couple of things come from this. President Obama has always said that he's actually open to different sources of energy. This proves this isn't true, that he's waited this long and suddenly, you know, all the delays now that he ha doesn't have another election, he's got rid of it. And it will have, a, and it also two other points. Number one, the green energy jobs, which I'm sure my colleagues here will talk uh -huh. about, require massive government subsidies. And number two, it, there are thousands means, of jobs that will be lost from this means, that could give means, money to American it, families. It means no <laughs> dirty tar sands oil from Canada. We get lots of other oil from Canada and that's not mm -hmm. gonna stop and there are lots of other pipelines. But this is a big moment for the environmental community. It's like drawing a line between the, the fossil fuel world of the past and moving into the, into the future. And I think it really does help uh, Obama's and Kerry's uh, legacy as uh, environmental stewards, if you will. And it's also helped by the fact that oil is at rock bottom lows. It doesn't make financial sense to extract that dirty oil from a Canada the, the and have oil, it go through our... The dirty oil. So the oil's going to be... Tar extract. sands oil is dirty oil. It requires oh, a lot of water right. to clean it, and it's a yeah. very you know, Trudeau, big process. Dirty Trudeau, oil. Trudeau, you. Yeah. You, Trudeau right? Trudeau in Canada, the new man in Canada, is sort of an environmentalist as well, but the dirty tar sands oil. That's true though. They, yeah, they might take it, send it to the West Coast and ship it off to the Chinese. The, the pipeline was supposed to come down through Nebraska all the way to the Gulf Coast and be, be refined, I think, and shipped out of here in any event. But yeah, as you mentioned, we're going to get more oil and gas, but there's no doubt about it that the fact that the price is down, the fracking has slowed down, the investment has slowed down, the wells are being shut in. But you wait for that thing to go b above $44 a barrel, whatever it is, go up to 75 a barrel. Right. That's and stuff that all oh start up again. It's a huge favor, right now, a favor for, for, for right Justin now. Trudeau yeah. as well. For right now, the fact, the fact yeah. that organized labor hasn't uh, made more noise. Uh, well, I'm, organized labor is going to do quite well. Uh, thank you very much. Because well, there aren't, there aren't oil, that many jobs oil can here. be shipped by Not, train. Right. There aren't that many I have jobs some in the pipeline. Well, exactly right. One million barrels of oil moved by train in the U.S. every single day. That's more than 350 million barrels a year. So who needs a pipeline? Well, no, who see, needs a pipeline? Yeah, see, this, I want to get on this because because liberals always talk about you know the jobs, jobs, jobs. But actually, there are jobs. Never talk there, about yeah. jobs. No, there are, no, but okay, but but jobs in the green. Look at the jobs that this could create. Yes, it would be a limited oh, number of thousands of construction. Wait, 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 wait. And, and some have. Okay, but it is about 4,000 construction jobs.
jobs. 40, huh? 40 jobs. No, that's not yeah. true. Washington 40, Post fact checker Greg Kessler did a good piece on it. Also, about the three, about how the three point two is, billion really spending on sure. products that you get. You're not off the economy. Sides. Eleanor is not off the hook yet because the opposition to Keystone XL merited is not merited. It's motiv motivated by ideology. The opposition is ideological, and ideology is radical environmentalism, Elena. And you go for it, because now there are lots of other targets ahead. Uh, so if you want to call it radicalism and ideological radicalism, go right ahead. But the, cli the climate movement has been energized, and that's you, a good thing you know for all of happened? us and for the planet. Okay, you know what has happened? Antarctica's ice sheet has been expanding at tens oh. of billions of ice a year, Public and that's going to be a real blow that. to your whole right. crowd, Ellen. Right. Uh, Public Greenland yeah, folks, yeah. that. Yeah. What do you mean? Right. Canada's right. going to be? No, the Antarctica, and, and, uh, because right. the whole ice and, uh, sheet, the whole climate change it, argument is going to be undercut by what's happening in you know, Antarctica. They're finding by satellite that that gigantic ice sheet, about seven times the size yeah. of the yeah. North Pole, did you is tell, expanding. Tell did you that tell to the, the polar bears. Did you tell the polar I'm in touch with him. Are you? That's the latest thing, a melting sheet? No, it's getting larger. No, larger? That's, 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 it's, it's that's a ludicrousy. It's ludicrousy. Uh, climate change is not a hoax. Prediction. Pat. John, Barack Obama came in saying he was going to take us out of war. When he leaves office, we will be at war in Afghanistan, at war in Iraq, at war in Syria, at war in Yemen, and Libya will itself be a disaster, which is moving millions of people across the Mediterranean into Europe. Failed foreign policy. <laughs> My, my prediction is Governor Christie and Governor Bush are talking compellingly about their personal experiences yeah. with, with addiction on the campaign yeah. trail. Next question for them, they're going to get a lot of pressure. How will they translate that compassion they feel from members of their family and their friends into public policy? Tom Rogan. It will turn out that uh, the Islamic State Sinai affiliate was responsible for downing the Russian airliner. The Russians will retaliate with force against groupings of people, but they will not focus too much on ISIS because they really want to push out the moderate rebels instead of ISIS. Uh, uh, the District of Columbia lost a very important uh, gun control case, the, the, the Heller decision, before the Supreme Court. Uh, and they're going to go at it again. I think they're going to get to the court again. I'm not going to predict whether the court will uh, find in their favor this time. But well, what prediction are you doing? Uh, You're not predicting the court. Not predicting. It's going to it's going to, it's going to come make it to the Supreme Court again. We're going to have is that your prediction? And not just D.C. but some other uh, others will okay. join in. I predict Christmas sales will be respectable. <laughs> Holiday sales will gain by four percent over last year, six hundred thirty billion dollars in purchases. And was that good news? I guess is that good news? <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>